Good morning. God has blessed us again to be here. He's given us the blessing of waking up this morning, having the right capacity in our minds and putting an intent in our heart to come here this morning. I know you thought the alarm clock woke you up and if you're anything like I used to be, you were mad when it woke you up, you wanted to throw it up against the wall. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But God put the intent in your heart to be here this morning and uh, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, regular, dedicated, faithful members of the Church of Christ here in Trent, as well as those who are visiting with us. We are delighted that you came our way, whether you're worshiping with us in person or you're enjoying our live stream over social media. We are delighted to have guests visiting with us. Anybody in person, if this is your first time here, raise your hand, please. We have a gift we want to give to you. See, see, I told you, I told you, I told you, I told you. People are hesitant. People are, he until I mention the word gift, hands go up. No, I'm kidding. I'm just, I, I knew, I knew my son was going to do it. I knew he was going to do that. Good to have the day family with us. Um, we, we go way back. Good to see all of y'all with us, as well as those other first time visitors with us. Trent Church, I'm glad to see you as well. Uh, this morning. On the prayer list, let's remember um, everybody who we've um, been praying for, specifically um, Andrew Pope and his family. Um, I think that's a student in uh, Roscoe. Ernest and I were talking on Wednesday, and my heart just kind of bleeds for that family. And I think this is a time, church, that we can, um, to quote the song, let our light shine by just being an example, sending them encouragement. I'm not so naive to, uh, to understand or to think. There is nothing I can say in any language, much, le much less the human language, that will comfort the mother in the passing of her child. There's no way we can do that, but we can at least um, let them know that we're praying for them, I think we're sending them a card. I think we're sending them a Bible just to let them know that we care. And I've told you this, and I'll get into the lesson. I told you this when I first got here. Um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's what I've been trying to do my time here in Trent is to just encourage us to, to just show love and encourage people in the community and to meet needs no matter how. Uh, small, um, just to do what we can to show the love of Christ. I'm also glad to see Billy Wayne uh, this morning. We are continuing to pray for him and thankful for the work that he has done all these years in helping uh, the Trent Church to, to keep going. And I'm standing on his shoulders and others as this ministry continues to grow. Billy Wayne, we're praying for you and uh, we're praying for Betty Sue. Um, as well. Men remember, oh, also on the prayer list, I've added, I mentioned this Wednesday, I don't know if I did last Sunday or not, Charles Goodnight, who uh, has preached here before um, when I was out of town, and he is also one of the elders <clears throat> at the Baker Heights congregation. His sister, George Ann, is uh, in ICU, and she is needing our prayers. Since I did this posting, I found out um, that she is actually out of ICU now and in a regular room, as I understand it. But still, I told Charles that we would be praying for his sister and for their entire family as, uh, as, she, makes, as she makes her recovery. As also was mentioned, men, we have a, a business meeting at 5 o'clock this afternoon here at the building. So please, um, there are some things we need to talk about. And uh, please, men, um, attend that particular meeting. One last announcement and then, well, two, and then I'll get into the lesson. Congratulations to uh, all the Trent ISD athletes. They had their awards banquet <clears throat> on, uh, on uh, last night. Uh, that was last night, wasn't it? Friday night, Friday night. And uh, I got a kick watching Richard eat all that food. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But we are trying. Well, he's not kidding. Okay. I'm trying to encourage us to do all that we can to get into the community. And we have a tremendous opportunity with the school right there. So we have a, a window to serve. And everything that we can do to encourage those students, then we're certainly going to do that. But congrats to uh, all the student athletes and their award banquet. The baccalaureate will take place. Monday the 22nd at the school um, cafeteria. The meal will start at six and then we'll have, we'll have the program to follow, to follow the meal. 
Okay, now what I'm supposed to be doing. This begins a new month, and uh, I'm starting this month. Um, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3 for most of the month, and we're going to talk about the lies that sin tells us. And all this month, and the cards are in the back. I didn't bring them up with me, but the sermon cards are in the back. Um, and if I run out, please let me know, and I can, I can bring some more. One of the things that we need to be aware of, especially in the times that we live now, preachers are afraid to call uh, balls and strikes when it comes to sin in our lives. We're so apologetic, I think, in everything that we want to do, and we don't want to step on any toes, and we don't want to hurt anybody until we've kind of left out part of that preaching when it comes to doing what's right and doing what's wrong. Well, you know what? You got the wrong preacher if you expect me to go down that road because the Bible is still right um, and all of the word of God is still the standard by which if we call ourselves Christians that we need to live by. And so this month, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3 starting today. And we're going to look at some of the lies that sin tells us. Sin is the major reason why we don't follow Christ as we should. Sin breaks our trust in God, and it, it really kind of shackles us to our actions of the past. And then once that happens, sadly, then we believe the enemy's lies. But what I want you to see this month, Satan and his patterns are predictable. And, and his rule book hadn't changed since Genesis chapter 3. And we still fall for the same thing over and over again. And what I want to do this month, looking at Genesis 3 as a backdrop, if we can look and see that the tricks that Satan uses, and, and if we can be forewarned about the tricks, then we can be forearmed. In other words, if you know the playbook, then you shouldn't fall susceptible to the play. I was growing up, and then we'll have our prayer and get right into it. When I was growing up, it was great fun to uh, scare my sisters uh, at night, me being the oldest and the only boy. Um, I used to be ashamed to say this, but I'm just telling the truth now. Uh, uh, Mama Gail, I could get away with some stuff my sisters couldn't get away with because I was the only boy. <laughs> so I would sneak in the room at night <clears throat> when they had to go to bed, and uh, I would hide. I would hide under the bed. And so as soon, uh, I hate to say this, I really don't, but I hate, as soon as that light go off and they get in the bed, my sisters weren't exactly comfortable in the, in the dark. And so as soon as that light would go off and they would get in the bed, I would be under the bed and I would pull those covers slowly. And all of a sudden those covers, uh, Chad, I'm sorry, I, I'm <laughs> and those covers would be slowly coming off that bed. And all of a sudden, I just make a noise. Woo. <laughs> I must have done that. Must have been three or four good years. You know why it was so much fun? They fell for it every single time. You'd have thought after the first one, but they fell for it every single time. That's sin. And that's how the enemy sometimes plays us. The rule book, guys, hasn't changed, but we fall for it every single time. Today, let's talk from Genesis chapter 3. And let's look at how Satan is crafty, but he is not straightforward. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the power of your word, and thank you, Lord, for everything that you do in our lives. We, 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 we fail you. We sin. We don't intend to do it. We know it breaks your heart, Lord, but we just are so thankful that you continue to love us in spite of ourselves. Help us to gain strength and fortitude uh, from looking at Satan's playbook and the fact that we know he's crafty. But, Lord, he has power, but you have all the power. Be with us now as we study and help us to take away from this um, maybe a sense of confidence, maybe a sense of, of, of hope that we don't have to fall for his tricks over and over again. Forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. We thank you and we love you for this and all your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the serpent <clears throat> was more crafty 
than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. King James there says he was more subtle. This NIV says crafty. He said to the woman in the midst of this conversation, and I want you to notice the playbook, and the playbook hasn't changed. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat the fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was, was good for food and, and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them <clears throat> were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Did you catch it? Did you see how now the stage is set and we are, we're now ready for this ultimate battle. I'm calling this battle temptation because again, as I keep saying that the playbook has not changed. When I was, when I was in Abilene um, on, on staff at Mendes Street, the other elders would tell me, now Fred, be careful. Don't ever use sports analogies because you don't follow sports and you're going to hurt yourself. Okay, so, I, you know, I learned a few things, and, and I, now I come to Trent, and who do I meet? Richard, the ultimate sports guy. Um, so I'm not going to hurt myself beyond just saying, what if you could get the playbook for the opposing team ahead of the game? Wonder would that help you? Would that, would that, would that serve you? Would, you? would that be of some value to you? Well, if you understand that, you understand now how the stage is set. And first, two things I want you to see here. First, you got to look at the tempter. And who is the tempter? That's the enemy. That's the adversary. That's Satan. That's the serpent, if you will. Second, you got to look at what they're tempting with. In other words, what, what is it, this one item that you're being tempted with? Because there's always something. You've got something that the, the enemy knows that he can tempt you with, and it works every single time. What is it being tempted? In this case, in Genesis 3, it's the fruit of the tree of good, the knowledge of good and evil. And listen, temptation always comes in subtle ways, in subtle stages, and it targets different areas of our physical and spiritual life. You remember after Jesus came out of the wilderness and he was hungry? You remember what happened next? The devil came to him and he tempted him and said, command these stones to be made bread. The temptation was at a point of vulnerability at the, at the time of Christ. You remember what Christ said in each one of those? It is written, leave me alone. I'm not falling for it. Take your tricks, take your hat, go away. I'm not falling for it. It is written. Notice how the serpent in Genesis 3, he is targeting specific things. And these specific things are important <clears throat> for us to observe because of two reasons. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really give us this, and I want us to take a deeper dive into Genesis 3 and really consider the fact that we are no different than Eve in the case that we also are tempted every single day in our lives. We're susceptible because of two reasons. Number one, the same areas, and number two, Satan hasn't changed the playbook, and he's doing the same thing today. Well, how is he doing it? Two things, two reasons. There were three, but I reduced them to two. Number one, by bringing about sin. In other words, People today don't believe in calling sin, sin. Well, you made a mistake. Well, it's a wrongdoing. 
No, we're not watering it down. The Bible doesn't water it down. Sin is still sin. Sin is the transgression of God's law, the willful doing of wrong when it comes to your actions. I knew it was wrong sneaking into my sister's room. I knew it was wrong. Miss Jennifer, hate to tell you this, I really don't. Um, I did it anyway. <laughs> and I knew if mom and dad, mostly mom, if mom was going to catch me, I knew there were going to be consequences. And usually there were. But you know what? I'd let that wear off. And two or three days later, know what I would do? I'd go right back and do it again. It's a perfect analogy, I think, when it comes to sin. The word sin actually means a willful act of breaking God's laws. It's kind of like me crawling into their, their room and getting under the bed. I knew exactly what I was doing, but I didn't want to bear the consequences. I thought it was great fun. Satan wants us to break the laws of God because it causes us to be disobedient. In other words, our actions are contrary to what God's instructions should be. Just like my mama kept telling me, uh, leave them girls, Junior, leave them girls alone. Yes, ma'am. Two or three days later, I'm right back under the bed crawling, and that sheet miraculously, those covers are still coming down off of the bed. See, I love this quote. Obedience is really all about faith, and it's an act of faith. But disobedience, think about this. Disobedience is the result of unbelief. See, the reason you disobey Okay, and I can't talk about you. Let me talk about me. The reason I disobeyed, because that, just that one time, maybe, just maybe, mom wouldn't get a hold of me and she'd let me slide. By the way, it didn't happen. I'm just letting y'all, historically speaking, it didn't happen. But it was just, I took that chance. Maybe just that one. And that's the idea. See, obedience is an act of faith. Disobedience, when you disobey, it's really because of unbelief. I don't have time to read it all. I'll just recap the story. Do you remember in 1 Samuel 15, the case of King uh, Agag? Um, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will punish the Amalekites uh, for what they did to Israel when they weighed, uh, when they weighed, laid them and they came to Egypt. Now go and attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. The instructions are specific their instructions are clear. I got a friend named Victor Hunter who's visually impaired, and he says blind, and the joke was Victor Hunter could see that in the dark. It's just that clear, just that clear. The instructions said, do not spare them. Put them to death. Men, women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. That was the instruction. Look at Saul's actions. Verse 8, he took Agag king of the Amalekites alive and all of his people and he uh, totally destroyed with the Saul but with sword but Saul and the army look what they did spared Agag and not only did they spare Agag they also spared the best of the sheep and the cattle and the fat calves and the lambs and because in their mind everything was good now I got to paint this picture for a second God said utterly destroy everything. They in their own minds said, wait a minute, now the king, we need to let him live. We can probably get a ransom for him. And all these good sheep and, uh, no, we need to say, those were contrary to God's <clears throat> instruction. These were, everything was good. Uh, these they were willing to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. You see the problem? God gave them specific instructions. They modified those instructions based on what they thought the way things should be. And when Samuel came to them, I love this. This cracks me up every time. Samuel came to him, and he, he, uh, he was going to check on things. And, and this is what Saul said. The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions, and I, in my mind, I kind of see if he had on a coat, which he probably didn't, his thumbs kind of go under his lapel. Hi, how you doing? I did everything God told me to do. <laughs> but, watch, but watch this. Samuel said, uh-huh. Then uh, answer a question for me. Why, what then is this bleeding of sheep that I hear in my ears? What, what is this lowering of cattle? That, if you killed everything, why am I hearing by 
<laughs> what, what about if you did what God told you to do, why am I hearing what I'm hearing? No. He decided to take things in his own hands, and you know the, the rest of the story. He ended up suffering, and his kingship and his life also, he ended up suffering because he forgot one valuable lesson that I want to remind us of. Irregardless of the times that we live in, church, God's word means what it says when it says what it means. If God gives us instructions, our job is to carry them out. The second thing that Satan really tries to get us and the rule book really hasn't changed. See, once we break God's law, we break his commands, then we, we sin. But not only that, that sin then brings us shame. And the word shame really means a loss of respect or, if you will, improper behavior. See, what the enemy is doing here, the enemy is actually double teaming you and me with not only sin, but shame. And if he can get you to sin and he can get you to feel shame, maybe you'll quit coming to church and you'll isolate yourself and then, sure enough, he got you. And see, that's where we need to tell people God still loves you. God loves what you are as a person are about. And we need to go back to, and I get in trouble for saying this every single time, we need to go back to when it comes to showing love to people and showing them that you don't have, when you sin, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You can still repent. You can turn your life around, but you have to be willing to part from that sin and start walking in the ways of God. And that's the problem, that we don't want to tell people that. We just want to make people comfortable and everything's coming up roses when really the Bible still says sin is sin. And then if he can get you to wallow in sin, not only that, but then he'll get you to feel shame. He's double teaming you. Why? Because with the sin compounded with shame, then that separates us from God. And that severs our relationship with him. And I'm going to tell you, as somebody who loves you, you cannot make it in this world without God. You can't. Don't try. I mean, please don't. But, but we cannot make it in this world without God. And we don't serve God just because he gives us stuff. That's not the motivation. We serve God because we love, he loves us, and he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sins. And all we can do in dedicating our life is still yet lacking. But we want to say thank you, God, for your goodness and for your mercy. But when you sin, realize it separates you from God. It puts, it puts you and me a guilty distance away from God. You remember what Isaiah said? Uh, it says, surely uh, the, the arm of the Lord is not too short that it cannot save. King James, I love uh, there. Neither is, is here his ear heavy that it, that it cannot save. And, and it says, your iniquities have separated between you and God, and your sin has hid his face from you. There is a difference between sin and iniquity. Think about it like this. One is the action the other one is the reaction. See, once I've sinned, that action causes a separation. And then hopefully, if I don't get, not hopefully, but if I don't get that thing right, then that separation gets wider and wider. You ever met some people, I'm, I'm winding up, you ever met some people that tell you, oh yeah, I used to go to church. Well, really? Um, and see, when people say that to me, um, I'm the wrong person to say that to because I'm going to ask you a question. I, I just am. Really? Why you stop? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Why would you stop? Then you get the full story. So one's about the action, and the other one, separation, when it comes to being a guilty distance away from God. Listen, even though you sin, and even though I sin, that's no reason to try to run from God. You can't run away from God. The truth is, he knew you did it before you did it. But we need to be open and honest and bring our, our life to God in a relationship with him. But your iniquities have separated, Isaiah said, you from God. 
and your sin has hid his face from you so that he will not hear. Did you notice that's on our part? That's not on God's part. But there is a point, and I'm ending with this verse, Proverbs chapter 1. There is a point if we get so stubborn and so hard-headed and so rebellious that we, we do what we want to do in spite of what God said for us to do. I never told you the end of the story, and I'll wrap up with my... Do y'all know how my mom got me to stop going in my sister's room, pulling the um, covers off? There's an, there's an end to the story. Anthony, mom said, it's obvious beating your hmm is not, is not working. So, Junior, let me just tell you, you go in there one more time, I ain't feeding you. Woo! <laughs> Jerry, that did it! <laughs> I was good. Yes, ma'am, I'll stop. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I'll stop. See, as parents, we need to know, we need to know what works with some children and what work, what doesn't work. With me, that worked. Now, the belt... I hate that I'm going to say this because you need to hear it. If my sister's watching, she's going to tell my mom I'm in more trouble. I'm just going to say it. Um, mom could swing a belt, but it wasn't, I mean, it was kind of light. <laughs> it was, it was kind of light. Uh, <clears throat> now, when dad, when dad took a turn, <laughs> so it didn't, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of light. So I could take that. But when the food was getting cut off, okay, my behavior changed. And that's what stopped me from doing that. God is not unlike or dissimilar. There's a point to where you continue to do what you want to do. And I know we talk about how God is loving and, and kind, and he is, but you haven't seen the other side of God. There's a point to where God said, oh, you want to do? Go ahead on with your bad self. Proverbs chapter 1, let me wind this up. God gets to a point when it comes to sin, if we persist in doing our own thing, he says it like this. But since you refuse to listen when I call, and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, and since you've disregarded all of my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I will in turn laugh when your disaster strikes or disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you since they hated knowledge and did not choose, look at the end of this, to fear the Lord. That's the thing. When I get in my relationship with God and I want to obey God because I love him and he loves me, it's not so much that I fear the punishment. Now I'm overtaken. I'm saturated by the love God has for me. Let me wind it up like this. So what's the big deal? Y'all know I always end like this. I've heard the lesson, Brother Fample, I understand about sin. So what? What does that, what does that have to do with me? And we're going to explore this more this month, all this month. Do not allow sin to permanently break your relationship with God. Don't do it. We all sin, and we all come short of the glory of God. But do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Do not allow that to permanently separate you between your relationship with God. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, and I'm done. John says, do not love the world or anything in the world. For anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Next week, I'm going to take up right where this leaves off. The world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever and that's what you want and that's what I want that's what we all want we want to continue to do the will of God in our lives join me tonight online at six tonight we're going to stay in the book of Philippians and we're going to talk about a fresh perspective in, in the book of Philippians especially if you're struggling especially for hard times Philippians will give you a fresh look especially for hard times times. If there is sin in your life, a mountain that you're facing right now, and you've tried to handle it on your own, let me tell you, stop. You can't. You can't make it without 
God. God is built in to his congregational fellowship, a time that we do what James says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you might be healed. James says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If there's something that you've been trying to handle on your own, stop. In just a minute, we're going to stand and we're going to sing song just as I am. And that's an opportunity. That should be a cue for you. Come forward and ask for prayer. Um, and we don't need all the sordid details. We just need to know your needs so we can pray for you and watch what God does as a result of your obedience and your confession when it comes to sin. Or maybe you have Bible questions. Your relationship with God isn't all that it needs to be. And, and you have a question from the Bible that, that you would like to ask. Come forward, ask that question. I will do my best to get you a Bible answer for your Bible question. And then maybe that can lead you to the same decision it led our sister Gail a few weeks ago to put Christ on in baptism. Or maybe you're already ready for baptism now. You come by hearing his word, believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ, being willing to be uh, added, baptized in water for the remission of your sins. You'll rise up from that liquid pool, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Whatever your need is, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing the song of invitation. <laughs>